Uh, so my name is James. I'm the co-founder of Savage, which is the company behind Procreate. My background is actually uh, a very bad illustrator, but <laughs> my my deepest passion has always been art, creativity from all walks, music, poetry, visual arts. Even though I'm not very good at producing them myself, it's certainly been my passion. That's kind of where Procreate was kind of born, really, was that love for the arts, but I had no intention to build a product like Procreate in the beginning. It was simply following my, my, um, my heart, I suppose. Yeah. How did this love for the arts lead you into making a software company? When I... When I first moved to Tasmania, I really didn't know what I was going to do with myself. I was smoking a lot of weed. I was playing a lot of video games. I was not really focused in life, if that makes sense. I was kind of just kind of rudderless. I moved here to Tasmania to try and find who I was, if that makes sense. And during the time, I just kind of took odd jobs, uh, washing dishes and mowing lawns, whatever I could do to earn some money and it was around that time that I discovered digital art so prior to that I, I'd been painting in oils I'd been using watercolors I had this crazy idea that I would sell art in galleries and all this kind of stuff and I did actually sell a few paintings here in Hobart and stuff but it takes so long to earn a living as a, as a traditional artist and when I discovered digital art I was lucky enough to get online for the first time. This is kind of around 2000, so it was quite a while ago. I got online and I just saw this explosion of digital art. And I knew at that moment what I needed to do. I'd kind of found my calling. I wanted to learn digital art. And so that, that's how it kind of started. And from there, I put myself through a diploma and started freelancing as a graphic designer. It was where, where I first started. There's lots of work as a graphic designer, not much work as an illustrator, but I found I could earn a living as a graphic designer. And from that, I got a fair amount of work together and I had to hire some people because we were getting a lot of work. And then that started my, my first little company, which was focused on brand branding, uh, web design, and web development. In the beginning, it was wonderful. I, I, I loved every moment of it. But after a little while, I became a little disillusioned with the client model, which is a very valid model. But for me personally, I, I really struggled with that. I really wanted to make stuff without the limitations of budget or without the limitations of what the client wanted. So that precipitated the idea of starting a new company and focusing solely on making the best quality software that we could make. We, we'd done a lot of web kind of software. So for us, it was kind of an easy transition to jump into a native development. Uh, and I was lucky enough to employ an incredibly talented engineer, Lloyd. Lloyd is an amazing engineer and he was just as hungry as I was to stretch our legs and really try and make something wonderful, something without limit, but, you know, the best that we could do. Even if it was going to be a failure, we didn't care. We just wanted to make something. And that was uh, where Procreate was born from. So what I'm hearing is this sort of deep desire to make something just wonderful, like just a great piece of software and the team to make that happen. It's not every day that a perfect storm like that happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, of any success story, there's always so much luck involved, so much timing and just so many things you just can't control. So, you know, we had uh, myself as a, as a designer, I was intensely interested in, in software design. We had Lloyd who was intensely interested in performance and uh, architectural engineering. We also had my wife, Alana, who was very interested in more of the commercial side and then the timing of the iPad. So there was lots of things in there that um, lined up. Right. I mean, I guess the stars must have aligned perfectly there. But on a slightly different note, is it true that I've heard that you still make all of the brushes for Procreate? Yeah, yes. I still really enjoy that part of the process. <laughs> it's one of the core. I mean, if you were to boil down what Procreate is, it is essentially a brush studio. You know what I mean? And we build kind of everything around that. Um, and again, that was one of Lloyd's real contributions to Procreate was the engine itself is so flexible and it makes my job as a designer so enjoyable to surface all of that power to customers to use in a usable way. Now, alongside that, I also heard that you are intricately involved in the design process and the design of the product as a whole. Can you maybe share with us a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so I was the first, I was the, the only designer in the beginning and the only right. illustrator in the beginning. I'm still the, the lead designer of all interface at, at Savage. It's something that 
I'm hoping we can expand to. We've been looking for other people who share the passion for beautifully made software, but it's taking us some time. Plus, I'm very selfish, though. I I, I love this part. You know, when the, the, the design of a product is is what gets me out of bed every morning. So I'm still very much involved. Where do you think this design intuition came from for you? And how does that manifest into the final product? The reason why I'm asking is because a lot of the time I'll see companies have great designers, but the final product doesn't really hit the mark. A, that's an interesting question. I think as artists and creatives, we, we observe the world and we synthesize it down in, into our work. And I think earlier on when I was young, because I was so into video games and electronics was another hobby of mine in the early times. And I've always been fascinated with devices and how they work. And I think just, you know, many years of essentially playing with uh, external material things, I think what that does is it builds up a lot of subconscious knowledge that, that you're able to synthesize down into some work. But I also think there's a lot of intangibles into how creatives work because you know, art is such an important part of humanity, but we really don't understand it yet. We spend a lot of time and research, especially academic or scientific research, into all facets of life, but we don't really do that with creativity and art. And I think if we did, I think it would be a, a, a fascinating endeavor to really uncover, because, you know, we're one of the only organisms that we know that really needs to manifest creativity. There's no other animal on the earth that can paint or or write poetry for no evolutionary reason either. It's just because we we have to do it. So I think I think there's a kind of an unknown component there. There's also the, the synthesizing the world of many years of just kind of observing the world. But I also think too, when you mention other companies where they're not able to, you know, with many very talented people make compelling software, I actually think one of the reasons for that is there's just too many people involved. Because, you know, if you had Picasso, and you put any number of wonderful artists together in a room and told them to paint a beautiful picture together, it would be terrible, I'm sure, because it's a committee. There's no singular purpose, right? There's no single-minded drive behind it. And when there's one sort of one mind driving it, you get a really big benefit, which is the ability to fail. And there's no one telling you that you shouldn't do it. And because of that, you've got this absolute freedom. There's no one telling you what should or shouldn't be doing, or I want to do it a different way, or we should do it this way. And so you're able to make a lot of mistakes along the way. You know, Procreate, the interface, I think I did almost 1,000 different iterations before I hit the, the, the current interface. And, and I was lucky enough to be able to make so many mistakes along those ways. And each mistake you learn and you build on, and it gives you knowledge that you otherwise weren't uh, able to have. In software, I think we've got a tendency to add more and more people to the design process. I think the opposite is needed. Right, right. So it sort of sounds like this intuition for how Procreate is designed and created is built around this central vision. Yeah, that's a, I think that, that's right. And, and also, again, just that ability to explore and iterate, it's just so important to settle on one specific design. You know, that, that scares me because there's so many, there's literally an infinite amount of possibilities that we could arrive at. Uh, and so the more you can explore, the more you learn. Hypothetically, there are 999 mistakes made before I made one good uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good uh, way to put it. On a slightly different note, though, do you have any favorite product that you like to use on a regular basis? Something that is like really, really well designed? I think, I think one of the nicest experiences I've had recently is Sonos. Just a speaker, a little speaker, uh, Sonos One to just carry around uh, outdoors. Yep. And... That whole experience from, you know, opening the box to having everything very clearly explained to pairing it to your Wi-Fi, pairing it to the phone, like you could tell people really cared. And that was very surprising. I haven't seen that much <laughs> recently. What about our worst design product? Do you have a product in mind that you like really, really dislike using? The worst design product? That's a really, really interesting question because there's so much that I dislike using. It's hard to <laughs> nail down. <laughs> one thing. I think one, one of my pet hates is, is car interfaces. I think there's so much room to improve in the car interface. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you pick, but the recent one, you know, Mercedes is so complicated and so unintuitive. Every time you think, uh, or, or rather a feature should, should exist, 
uh, you you go into that particular section, it's got nothing to do with with what was first described. And I find myself <laughs> laying in bed at night thinking up ways that I'm going to redesign this and send them designs and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. What about if you, if you compare the two, like the best design product and the worst design product, what do you think is the difference between how these two products were designed? There's one thing that comes to mind, which is Sonos put themselves at the center, not the customer. I, and, I, and I don't know, I'm not Sonos, but it, to me, it seems like they put themselves in the shoes. So as designing it, you know, I think, what would I like? How would I want that to, to feel? And when you start making those choices as a designer, it becomes incredibly empowering because you can start to lessen the compromises because you're not going by a sales spreadsheet or a uh, you know something from the executive team. When you put yourself in there, it becomes personal, you know. And I think for the Sonos guys, it re- to me anyway, I could be completely wrong, but to me, it seems like they really put themselves at the center and made sure that they would want to have a beautifully designed experience. Whereas you know the car interfaces would have probably been made by sales teams or engineers that were probably uh, not putting themselves in that position, they'd be putting the customer in that position. But when you put a customer in that position, you're removing the humanity because that's just an ephemeral target. It's not personal, it's not real, you know? So I think the biggest fundamental difference is putting yourself as a designer in in that space. That's a very, very good point. The customer really, it's just a word, right? What about Savage Interactive? How come Savage Interactive is so good at making products that are so intuitive to use? Like, what is the secret sauce there? Can you maybe share with us a little bit about that? Sometimes we've developed features for years and, and we just don't ship them. Even when people would think that they're, they're ready to ship, we, we have an internal bar that we, we were trying to reach. And as I mentioned with Sonos, what, one of the things that we definitely do is, and, and I know I do personally, is I put myself in, in the customer's shoes very personally. Would I want to draw or would I want to use it this way? And when the answer is no, it doesn't matter if we'd make a lot of money. It doesn't matter if uh, customers are screaming for it. If the answer is no, we, we just don't ship it. Sometimes it means that we don't ship the feature at all. And there's been lots of things that customers have asked for that we haven't shipped because we just haven't reached that bar. And alternatively, there's lots of things that we've reached that have. And I'll give you an example. One of the most simplest things people wanted to do. How do I draw a straight line or a perfect circle, right? This is some of the most basic things you want to do as an artist is simple geometry. Now, normally in software, you would go something like file, menu, shapes, circle or something to that effect, right? And it would place it on the screen and so forth. Would I want to use that? No. So that started a design process of, well, what would it be like? And we came up with a really interesting idea. And whilst my idea was was quite simple, which was just shape recognition, I draw a shape and Procreate will recognize it. It sounds so simple from a, from a designer's perspective, but the interpretation of that from an engineering perspective was, was very difficult. So we, we had the first version done very rapidly, but it wasn't good enough. So we didn't want to ship it. And we, we held that back for three years. Three years, it came back on the development. Oh, we're going to release it in Procreate 4.2 or whatever it was. And it's still the answer was no, we would not want to use it. It's not reliable enough. It's not careless enough. And so we continued to do that until three years later, we finally released that feature. But by saying no means that we're not filling Procreate with thousands and thousands of features that are kind of good. We're only putting in to Procreate what we would want to use and what we believe to be good. And we haven't always got it right, but we we try. That's the, that's the aim. And so the biggest thing that separates us from some of our friends out there is that we we only ship stuff when the answer is a yes. You, you could, of course, spend an infinite amount of time making sure that every single feature is perfect, right? So how do you balance that with actually just getting it out there, getting the product out there? Like, when is the yes? That That is a, a very important part of the equation. That's a very good question. And the answer is we have a process that is based on iteration. So almost everything in Procreate, we will launch something that we think, yes, we would want to use this. But behind closed doors, there's probably a hundred other things we've wanted to do. And it's probably lots that the customers have been asking us to do. And so what we do is we come back in the next version or in versions ahead and we, we refine that and we refine it again. And so 
almost everything in Procreate that we see today has had that evolutionary kind of process. One of my inspirations is Porsche. I love that when you look at a Porsche, it is undeniably a Porsche. They have refined that from version one to, to where they're at now with the 992. And that is a beautiful evolution that is unmistakably a Porsche. And a lot of the features that we develop, we know that, okay, well, the market requires this feature. It, it is now a yes. There's more to do, but we will ship it at the yes. And then we will swing back and we will, we will improve that. And Procreate as a whole has had that ethos uh, the, the whole way through. So even when we release something and people say, you know, oh, this is good or it's close, normally speaking, uh, internally, we have plans uh, for the next X amount of revolutions that we're going to swing back and polish up. And there's many examples of that within Procreate from interface and also from a technology standpoint. If you look at our first engine, which was OpenGL and was was it set a benchmark in the industry when we first uh, launched it? Lloyd and his team has refined that over and over and over and over again. So we shipped version one. It wasn't fully featured. It wasn't, um, uh, you know, didn't have every feature uh, that, that customers wanted, but it was a yes from us. We would want to use this. And then we came back and we improved it and, and so on and so on. Okay. So it's, it's sort of mostly about your internal bar, like when you feel it's ready, right? Yeah, and you, you do have to balance it with what customers want. There's definitely, you know, we've had, for instance, um, one, one feature that we didn't ship for a while, which was text. Everyone wanted text and we were like, right. no, we're a drawing product. We're never going to do text. <laughs> customers were emailing us daily and on our forums, they were asking us text. We want text. And we heard the message. And so we, we set about developing uh, that process, but it went through the same kind of process. It, it hit a yes, but we've come back through text a few times and, and improved that. And there's more coming. <laughs> That's great news. In a recent live stream that you did, I heard you and Claire talk about the development process at Savage Interactive. And you were sort of describing it as being very different from how other companies uh, develop software. I heard it being described as unique and inherently savage. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit about that? Just explain a little bit about what makes the Savage development process different from other companies. Look, I don't know if it's... If it's um... Maybe that sounds like hyperbole now, whatever I've said in the past, but I, but I think um, we approach the development of software more like musicians. So we don't have a spec sheet and we don't have features. We don't do sprints in the, in the software world. There's uh, techniques and I'd probably call them traditions, which like, you know, agile and so forth. And, and that, that's all built around this, this very conventional, let's, let's develop software, let's develop it fast, et cetera. Right. We, we literally have none of that at Savage. We, we develop it more like we are, and I use the word musician because it's the closest thing I think we could find. So I can give you an example of that. So we would get together in a room and we might say, well, the customers want to do X or uh, I have this really cool idea of what we, how we can make Procreate do such and such. So it starts with an idea or a wish from the community. And from that, we don't actually do any work as in computer work. We sit there and talk and those discussions can uh, drift off into all sorts of crazy discussions about life and the meaning of the universe and everything but they'll, they'll inevitably come back to the problem. And then we, we sort of start coming up with ideas, you know, maybe it could look like that. And, and what we try and do is we try and not tell each other that that's a bad idea. What we try and do is build on that. So instead of, I don't like that, it's more, what about, or what if? And so we start this process and then we might crack open the laptops and then we'll start coming up with some designs and we'll start making some prototypes and then we'll show each other and we all get very excited and we will see a couple of us running around the office with iPads going, check this out, use it, you know? And, and if we elicit a really happy response or an excited response from other people, that makes us more excited and the loop repeats itself. And so it's more like making a song. It's more like getting together based on that nebulous feeling of something feeling good. That's a very important part of our development process. We don't try and make features or software that is flashy. We just try and make stuff that feels good. And it's a very hard thing to try and put a 
a measuring stick on because what feels good to me may not feel good to you, you know? So it's very subjective. The thing that counterbalances that is that we have an incredibly good team within Savage that I've built a lot of trust with. So when you have a lot of like-minded people and a lot of diverse points of view, the process of making the song, it gets kind of refined by many different points of view. And the other important part is that the designers and the engineers, we're one team. We don't have a design team and then an engineering team. It's one team. And so we, we consider ourselves colleagues and we are here to make uh, software. And, and the way that we do that is a very musical, uh, enjoyable process. Okay, that's a, that's a very good analogy. And it makes perfect sense because when you think about it, like creating a song, it's not about making the intro, then the verse, then the chorus, then the bridge, then the chorus, and then the outro. Like Then it's a good song. It doesn't really work that way. Totally. Totally. And I think I think also to a lot of the conventions around software development, I don't think they were made by designers or by software engineers. I think they were made by salespeople. And I think you, you, when you look at that, the primary focus is pushing out software fast. There's, there's other stuff involved in that, of course. But I think when you take all that away and when you just make software and you're trying to make it feel good, much like a song, and you want to hear it again, or you want to use it again in this case, it, it can be very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. But creating anything comes with a learning curve, whether you're creating a portrait painting, a software or sketch or whatever it may be. There's always this sort of deep learning curve attached to it. And a lot of the times I see in my comments this sort of fear of failure creeping up. Can you maybe share with us the start of your journey when starting up Savage Interactive and how you overcame this fear of failure to create a successful business? Um, that's a that's a big one because we all suffer from that uh, as as artists, right? The, the feeling of, um, I don't know about you, but I, I suffer from imposter syndrome. I think what, one of the things that, that I encountered and that I had to overcome was the fear of failure. Even the very idea that I would fail, it can, it can be very difficult to overcome that that fear itself. But what, what I realized is that there's nothing tangible about fear, right? It's just in my mind. The, the idea of it is what's actually prohibitive, not the actual outcome. And what, what I realized was that if I just start, it doesn't really matter where it goes. If I start, then I can overcome that, that fear. And pretty soon, you know, in the early years of Savage, it, going through that process, I, I became quite emboldened, actually. And I felt I could, you know, you, can't, you kind of build on, the, on that confidence as you, as you start tackling things. And I became quite emboldened. But one of the other really important things is to listen to the little voice. It's something I say to my, my guys all the time. We, we all have inside us this little voice that tells us what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. And what we, what we often do is we repress it. We say that, you know, that little voice is, uh, is something that we should try and quieten down. You know, we don't want to listen to that little voice. You know, I'm sure you've, you've been through it yourself where you're experiencing something and you have that intuition that tells you you should be doing that. And you know that that's what you want to do. But, you know, life's too hard or you've got to pay the bills, you've got to do that. So what we do is we suppress that, um, that little voice. But that little voice is the, that's the magical guiding star of your life, you know. And I, I learned to start listening into that, even when it made me very uncomfortable. I, I started to learn to listen to that little quiet little voice telling me what I should be doing. And that was very, very effective for me personally. I don't know if everyone would benefit from that, but it certainly benefited me to start tuning into that because we, we all have dreams and hopes and aspirations, but we allow the world around us to tell us that we shouldn't do it. And I think that's so dangerous because when you actually listen to what, what, your, what your heart's telling you, that's where real happiness can be found. And I don't mean happiness like you're running around every day in sunshine because no one's really happy all the time. But you do get an immense amount of satisfaction from following your heart and from listening to what's really, really important to you. And so like earlier on, I said I, I didn't like the client model. And that was my little voice, you know, telling me I don't like this, but I, I suppressed it. I don't, you know, I have to pay the bills. I have to do this. Uh, and it only got to a point where it was it was so loud that I had no, uh, I, I had to follow that that voice, you know. 
the biggest thing I could say is that listen to the little voice. Don't listen to what others are telling you. Listen to the little voice. Don't listen to what other people are telling you. It's a very good advice. I'm curious now, based on our conversation, would you describe yourself as being an artist? That's a really good question. Um, I think if I had to place myself in, in a category, I, I would probably put myself in the artist category. Yeah, I think whatever field of, of creative endeavor that, that you're involved in, I think that there's a, there's a, a similar quality or a, or a similar affinity that, that we all have, which is the love of making and that that joy of creation. And I think even though software is a bit nerdy and a bit, bit computer geeky kind of, that's how people see it, um, I, I do think it is an art form to make beautiful software. So I suppose so, yeah. It is an art form to make beautiful software that you use to make beautiful art. Yeah. <laughs> Inception, man. <laughs> on, on the topic of beautiful art, I'm curious, do you draw at all? Like, what does your Procreate library look like? What do you like drawing? You know, I started off trying to mimic, uh, you know, sketches and, and oil painting and more traditional kind of painting. That was that was years ago. Nowadays, Fogere, I'm, I'm looking for, for my style, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm really trying to find something unique uh, and something different. But I'm also trying to do that in a way that's joyful. You know what I mean? So it's, it's this kind of, I'm caught in this kind of artist block at the moment where uh, I don't want to scientifically try and make a, a new style, but I also am sick to death of what I'm drawing and I want to try and uh, find something that's very unique. Uh, and so that that's leading my Procreate library to look a bit, uh, <laughs> it's a bit haphazard. There's lots of different uh, things going on. Also, a lot of sketches for interface uh, ideas and icon designs. Lots of random thoughts sometimes that pops into my head. If I if I'm drawing, I'll just scribble down there on another layer or something and, and continue on. So I think if someone was to look at the the gallery, they'd say, "What the fuck is going on here?" Because it's <laughs> it's just uh, a little bit of everything at the moment. Right. Okay. Okay. Do you display your art though anywhere? Like. Do you have an Instagram or something like that? At the moment, I'm so embarrassed of my work because uh, it's like a muscle, you know, and if you don't exercise it regularly, it, it, you almost get atrophy. I, I think um, I, I, I'm so lucky to work with just literally the best artists on, on, you know, on the face of the earth. And man, it's just awe-inspiring watching these people make these incredibly beautiful works of art. You know, I... I that's one part of my job that just never gets old is just seeing what people make with Procreate. And it just, that fills me with inspiration to, to work on Procreate, not so much to draw anymore because I, I kind of feel like, man, that's years of work. Those guys are so good. I'm never going to be like that now. And I, and, and I also think that um, you know, design itself, as we mentioned, it, it, is, it, it really is an art form and there's so much to explore there. We're only here for such a short time on earth. You know, I feel like, the time that we have, we, we have to really use it uh, as wisely as we can because we're not going to get any more of it. And so I, I think I've probably chosen to dive more into uh, the design uh, side of things uh, these days. Yeah. Now let me know in the comments down below what insights you gained from this interview. And don't forget to like this video. If you liked it, share this video with anybody who might be interested. I want to thank you all very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.